Hello and welcome to another episode of Through an Opaque Lens with me, Niall Murphy, coming at you on the 26th of May, 2024. It's been over a week since I've done a video. It's been a bit of a faff recently, and that's why. Um, anyway, um, this week has been quite an interesting week. A couple of things have dominated my uh, feed, and I have to talk about them because uh, they kind of reflect the demise of Britain. You've got politics, and you've got identity politics, from Rishi Sunak to Doctor Who, right? And uh, I'm gonna start with the boring stuff, gonna start with old Rishi. I'm not really all that greatly interested in politics in the UK. You know, if I wanna to go to sleep um, or cure my insomnia, I'd do that really. But apart from freaking me out or sending me to sleep, I just don't see any point in it really. I mean, you know, the system itself is so difficult, it would take nothing short of a revolution of significance to change it. Um, and I do think that change is coming to the UK, but I think that like a, a huge paradigm shift needs to happen first before it will do. There's too big of a swamp to drain, isn't there? You know, that's the trouble. So stop the boring stuff. Rishi Sunak, very significant, will go down in history, but for all the wrong reasons, right? Standing there outside 10 Downing Street doing his resignation speech and talking about what? Does it resignation speech? No, announcing the election, which ironically is on the 4th of July. And here I am thinking to myself, why can't we have what the Americans had on the 4th of July instead of this? Because we're going to have the opposite. Right. So, Rishi Sunak standing out in the rain, hasn't even got any staff to stand by and hold a brolly over him while he's making a um, speech you know, confirming the election and huh, talking about how the economy's improving. I mean, they always do that, don't they? I mean, you know, like, uh, you know, if he's standing in quicksand and going under, he'd be talking about how very much alive he is and how safe he is, because that's politicians for you, eh? <laughs> anyway, so, um, some bloke is playing outside down the street, incredibly loud, so it picks up on the microphone. Things can only be get better by D. Ream, which was, of course, um, Tony Blair's anthem that he brought in, um, you know, during his uh, election campaign. Um, so this person's obviously definitely a lefty Ramona type, you know, because um, things will certainly not get better in Britain. Not, um, you know, considering now that Britain's going to end up with a government no one wants. And the only reason why they're voting for a government that no one wants is because the Tories are not worth voting for. Most people are going to default to Labour. And voting for any other party in a first-past-the-post system is very difficult. And, you know, most people are kind of um, in Normieville. They don't know what to do and, don't, and are quite risk-averse when it comes to all this stuff. Um, so British politics, the way it is, is quite stagnant. There's not really much you can do about it. It's like being in quicksand. It's a swamp that's almost completely undrainable. And um, there's just... I don't have much hope. The only hope really comes from revolution, a kind of real, proper, grassroots revolution of sorts, a bottom-up revolution that is not, um, how can I say, subverted by uh, uh, outside donors, outside bad actors who wish to, um, you know, drive Britain into some lefty quagmire. It couldn't really get further into that if it wanted to, really, could it? That's the trouble that Britain has at the moment. So, Rishi's standing out in the rain, listening to Tony Blair's anthem, you know, the party opposition thing, Keir Starmer is likely to become the Prime Minister then, after the 4th of July, which would actually be a very bad 4th of July for anyone, and um, the Americans can laugh at us for this, right? <laughs> That's the thing. Keir Starmer, a man who can't tell you what a woman is, cannot uh, differentiate between working class and middle class, even when he's under interrogation. Watch this. You describe yourself as working class. Sakir, define working class. No, working class is um, families that, um, you know, work for their living, earn their money through um, going out to work every day, not through do, other not means. Do not middle classes do that? Well, working class um, families have the ordinary hope to get on in life. I mean, this has been Don't a story of middle classes time. have that Yeah, of course well. they do. Of course they do. So what's but the I distinction? Was, I, was I was addressing... Um, a particular thing, I think, with working class families, which is this sense that... But, so I talked about the nagging voice that mm -hmm. uh, many families have, that this isn't for you, this isn't for me. And I think that holds people back. But I do... Because people will say to me, well, look here, you know, um, you've 
come a long way. Yeah, <laughs> You're, yeah you know, went how to you state school. Yeah, but that, that is the ordinary hope of the working class, which is to have a decent education, to get a decent, secure job, to get a car, to get a, you know, have a nice but, holiday, to have but it, a isn't house. that the middle class too, Sir Kit? Everything it, you just listed? No? It me is. On. Yeah, it is. And, it, and that's why many people go on their life journey from what you might call uh, working class to middle class. I don't find that at all surprising. Okay. Um, I find that very ordinary. Now, I'm not a fan of LBC or Nick Ferrari, but the thing is, he did give uh, Keir Starmer a damn good grilling, and Keir Starmer couldn't get himself out of that, you know. So um, he kind of can't answer fundamental questions. He's definitely, um, you know, compromised. He's, you know, but when asked about Davos, well, I'd already pointed this out, he prefers Davos to Westminster. He's um, the Davos man of, you know, and soon to be the Davos Prime Minister. Nothing will really change in Britain. Things will only get worse. Things can only get worse. And of course, um, we've got to bear in mind that um, D Ream, as you know, after disbanding, one of the members of D Ream, Brian Cox, became a professor and therefore was one of the gatekeepers with letters after his name in the UK too. And uh, you know, so, so yeah, uh, it just, you know, Forget the political system, forget Westminster, forget what happens in it. Um, you know, the thing is that there's, there's really, honestly, you know, no hope there anymore. Um, something has to change, but it cannot be really changed in the ballot box. Now, according to Mary Finch, who I've seen on quite a few, um, you know, podcasts, saw her face for the first time. She'd been interviewed by David Kurt, and I think she was interviewed by someone else. I can't remember who he is. She, through experience, has uh, worked out that it is possible to affect change in the UK if you go for local elections and council elections. And if enough independents went in there and were able to somehow win people away from uh, the, uh, you know, from the usual partisan, the usual, was it uni party, lib lab, con green types, and independents could come in, um, they would be able to make quite a little bit of difference on a more microcosmic level, i.e. local councils, right? But when it comes to the people that you're going to get into Downing Street, the way it looks is that, say for instance, uh, if Richard Tice and uh, Reform were to get a big, big chunk of uh, people voting for them, because of the first past the post system, um, that would not be well represented in the amount of seats. And a lot of people think that they're going to slaughter the Tories, that the Tories seats are going to go down to really low, and that somehow the Reform Party is going to come up and get really high. I think there's a chance that reform will get a few seats, but they'll be incredibly, incredibly few. Um, because of the first-past-the-post system, a non-proportional system, it basically means democracy doesn't really work in the UK. You're stuck with this situation where Britain is going to be governed by a party that no one wants because no one can be asked to do anything about it. And there isn't much incentive for anyone to do anything about it either. And as a result, the only thing that can happen is some form of cultural revolution. Because if there's any one thing that is upstream from politics, it's culture. And if the right people could actually um, drown out the wrong people in the culture and could somehow have an effect on the zeitgeist, I think this is the only way Britain's gonna change. I don't know, I don't really have much hope at the moment, I'll be honest, right? So, anyway, boring stuff out of the way with there, right? Well, what I also would like to talk about is Doctor Who. Because Doctor Who has become the most woke thing in the universe recently. Uh, what happened was that Shuti Gatwa, whose name is spelt Nakuti Gatwa, but I'm going to be referring to him as Fruity Gatwa. Now, I'm not going to say why I'm going to be referring to him as Fruity Gatwa, but what I will do is I'll play you a little clip from uh, a live um, bit excerpt of Lonnie Donegan's My Old Man's a Dustman, which he used to get all music hall and throw a few I say, I say, I say jokes in there, right? So here's a little bit of that for you now. I say, I say, how do you make a fruit cordial? I don't know, how do you make a fruit cordial? Be nice to me. <laughs> Interpret that any way you want. So, yeah, Fruity Get Wild, right? Who has become <coughs> Doctor Who as a result of splitting down the middle from David Tennant right, and by generating, which there's definitely a pun in there, isn't there, right? Um, and they've called it season one this time, and Disney Plus has it, and so far what's happened is it's had the worst ratings 
that in its entire almost 61 years because people don't want to watch it. The backlash against it is enormous. But what happened was that the team, everyone from you know, Fruity to Russell T Davis, the showrunner, to you know, quite a few of the other people in there say that they don't want all these straight white men, uh, racist bigots and all the rest of it, homophobes and yeah, all the rest of it. They don't want them watching it. It's not for them. And uh, oh God, there was some drag queen in one episode as well. Forget his, her name, its name, right? Not important, don't care. Right. But, uh, it was grotesque. I don't only know because I saw other people reviewing it, and so as a result, I saw a few small clips out of it. I don't recommend you view it. If you value your sanity, um, don't watch it, really not. It's completely unwatchable, and uh, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go near it anymore. I think at the moment, the only thing I would want to do is come up with some. Uh, Doctor or Gallifrey uh, related um, anti-woke fan fiction of my own but I don't know writing a book or writing a story is not in my you know not, it's not the greatest talent that I have plot lines and all that but nevertheless I think it'd be worth doing just for a joke you know and of course I could uh, put an audio book somewhere on a, a site somewhere is it like Kofi? Can you do it on there? Possibly, right? And then I could just accept donations. I wouldn't be selling it then, so therefore I wouldn't be uh, infringing copyright. I just ask for donations if people like it. But I think that'd be a great idea. Whether I get around to it or not, that's another thing. But uh, the thing is, they were saying that, that all the people out there um, who um, don't like the direction that the programme is going in should go out and touch grass and not watch it. Well, they got what they wished for. The ratings plummeted down to like, you know, 2.6 million, 2 million, what, is it 1.9? I don't know if it's, but, but you know, show after show after show, we're losing something like about 400,000 views on the previous one. And it turned out that the, the overnight ratings, back in the day before the internet when television was analog, they would go by what happened live and they get the ratings from that. And um, you know, nowadays they go by the iPlayer and they do it over a certain amount of time. But the ratings are, basically you know 10% of what EastEnders used to get in the 1980s and somewhere like about I mean Doctor Who is best in the modern era got up to somewhere between 6 and 10 million views in, in the UK and now it's falling down to 2 million and it's, uh, it's probably going to fall down to less than 2 million. The only show that didn't get enough views was the pilot um, back in 1963 when it first came out and then the next episode got more and more and more so the first broadcast of the first episode got such, um, such a low rating. I believe it was because it coincided with JFK's assassination, and that's probably why people didn't watch it. Right? But in all the rest of the time, there have never been um, so few views on Doctor Who as what there are now. And now it's on Disney Plus <laughs> as well as BBC. And now it has more money and more production values put into it as well. But the little clips that I did get of it, for a start, it's quite obvious. Now, I'd have no problem, really, if, if, the, if the Doctor turned female, if the character was good, that'd be all right. Alex Kingston, when she played River Song, I would have um, actually been um, happy with uh, her being the Doctor because she was quite charismatic and quite charming. And if, for whatever reason, they come up with a reason for why, and they could have done this. They could have said, right, this new regeneration cycle has actually um, of course some mutations which are going to cause you to change race and to change gender they could have said that they could have put that in they could have said that the new regeneration cycle when matt smith became peter capaldi caused a few anomalies to happen and then that would have been believable and then on top of that i think that if someone like alex kingston instead of being river song was actually lined up to be the doctor that would have worked because jodie whittaker was terrible the whole chris chibnall era was terrible i couldn't watch it now the old crowd, Russell T. Davis, uh, Julie Gardner, and all the rest of them have come back. Even Murray Gold, who'd done the music for the original one. They've all come back, and even Stephen Moffat's come in and wrote a few. So what's happened there is, you've got the old crowd. But for whatever reason, they have completely jumped on the woke bandwagon. And it's like you just can't get through an episode without them referring to a relationship that is not heterosexual. It's like, uh, or they have to do the pronoun policing, or something like that. Or they have to have a, you know, a trans person, or they have to have a drag queen in there, or they have to mention something about some lesbian or gay 
um, do or party that was going on. And it's like, why do you have to keep doing that? It would be all right if you just shut up about all of this stuff. You see, I'm trying to think now of, a, of an actor that I thought would have made, if it, say it was back in the 70s or the 80s, I can't remember the name of the actor who was the black gentleman who was in Rising Damp with Leonard Rossiter, the really posh voice. And if he had become the Doctor, I would have no problem with him because he, he had the part, he has the personality, he had the voice. I think he would, no one would have minded all right, if that would have happened. Again, no one would have minded if um, you know, Alex Kingston had become the Doctor too. But the trouble is that we've got, it's clear and obvious to a lot of people that choosing Shuti Gatwa is, he's definitely chosen uh, because he ticks all the right diversity boxes. And I've heard that he was good in that programme Sex Education that he was in before he was in Doctor Who. And I'm not saying he's necessarily a bad actor. But the way that the showrunners want the programme to go in, and I've heard Russell T Davis do a lot of talking about how this is 2024, the times have changed, this is the way the new world is, we have to do this, we have to do that, we, you know, we, we can't be this, we can't be that, this is the new way and this is um, how it goes. And, you know, like um, my, my argument there is, this is what you call an ad novitatum fallacy, a non-argument based on that the new must therefore be better than the old because it's new. And maybe the new is questionable. And maybe um, the reason why people are zo zoning out and tuning out and just getting away from Doctor Who, um, incidentally, right, um, was it Shooty Gatwa or someone like that said, if you don't like it, you can go out and touch grass. I have this image in my mind of people going out to touch grass and they can't get anywhere near the grass because everyone else is touching it and so they end up having to touch pavements instead. I reckon that's how few people watched it in the end, right? So all the parks will be full of all these grass touching people and there's no one there and you want to go out and think, oh shit, there's no grass for me to touch. I might as well go home and watch Doctor Who and that's why their ratings didn't fall down even lower. Right, but yeah. So. The thing, of course, I'm losing my train of thought now, whether it comes back to me or not, I don't know, right? But the thing is that, that like, if it's really obvious that this identity politics has been shoved down a throat, it's getting in the way of the writing, it's getting in the way of good stories and good plot lines, it's creating mediocrity. And from the press releases and from what, you know, the production team and the actors and the showrunners and all that seem to be saying is that they're very, very hostile towards the people who were the original fans and um, you know everyone's writing you know there was a woman in, in the Metro newspaper who wrote you know sorry straight white men um, Doctor Who is not just for you or something like that and there was such a backlash against her that Metro the newspaper had to take down their entire um, Twitter account X account <laughs> before putting it back up because it was just too much for them right so the thing is all this stuff about inclusive uh, conclusivity and um, you know, diversity and acceptance comes at the expense of one demographic of people that they are extremely hostile towards. If you want to include everyone in everything, in all groups, you don't, you know, and you don't want to, you shouldn't have to create an outgroup, and the outgroup should not be the overwhelming majority of the country that you're in. You know, like I say, I'm right, men, 49%, women, 51%. I mean, that's not a minority or majority thing, but of course, you know, you know, this sort of feminist thing about patriarchy and all that is that. When it comes to, um, you know, how many people are black and how many people are white, how many people are in between in the UK, it's still a majority white country. So by having, you know, how can I say, if you, if you just have like, if you had a hundred people, um, if you had a whole series and there were a hundred actors in it and you had three black people, and I know, five, um, you know, Indo-Asian people or something like that, and the rest of them were white, and half of them were men, half of them were female, and there was the odd one or two gay characters in it. But, but you know, no one overshadows anyone else, and, you know, it was written so well and scripted so well, directed so well, that it didn't draw attention to the diversity and shove it in your face. Then no, no one would mind. And the problem is that, uh, no one wants to be lectured to or lambasted or, you know, no one wants to be condescended to when they want to sit down and watch entertainment. They just um, want to be able to escape all of that without having a political agenda shoved down their throat from, I was going to say, like, like a BBC. There you go, there's a pun in there somewhere. Hey. 
And so people will start tuning out. And um, this can only, and why would they carry on making a loss? Why would they carry on wasting all their money and all their resources and doing all that, knowing that the ratings are going down, knowing that everything is going down, unless of course, a propaganda agenda, if you like, uh, uh, shoving the message down your throat is more important than money, so much more important than the money that you make from it all, that um, you're willing to risk everything to brainwash the next generation. Is this what it's about, this demoralization agenda? So, we have, um, you know, recycled, regurgitated franchises like Doctor Who, of course, you know, and Star Wars is another one of them, which, uh, you know, less and less and less people want to watch because they're sick of being insulted like this. And I mean, I'm sure that there are plenty of people out there, you know, who are, uh, who are gay and there are plenty of people out there who, who are of a diverse mixture of races, cultures and all sorts of things who equally don't like what's happening because they kind of think that, well, you know, I'd, I'd like my, uh, you know, although I would like my position to be promoted, I wouldn't like it to be promoted in this way because it makes us look bad and it alienates us and it attracts lots of hostility. And I'm sure it does. But they're in their little Islington metropolitan elite bubble and they don't know what's going on in the world. The problem is that echo chambers are everywhere and to some degree, if you're online, and a lot of people are online, we're all stuck in them. So, you know, the, but the trouble is that some people cannot admit that they're stuck in echo chambers because they consider themselves to be the gatekeepers of culture, the, a top-down gatekeeper of culture. They're absolutely right in their minds and everyone else is absolutely wrong while well, they're completely out of touch with reality. And um, it's going to take a lot of undoing. It really is. So, this is Britain now, you know. It's, uh, it's music, it's art its culture, everything about it is being undermined and demoralised by this terrible agenda. And then there's the politics side of it as well. Britain's going to end up with a government no one really wants and no one knows how to do anything about it. Where I am at the moment in the Philippines, there's no mention of pronouns, you know, there's no mention of any of that. People just look like normal people here. All right, you might get the odd, you get the odd freak and the odd weirdo here because a bit of Western culture comes in. You know, nothing wrong with that, in my opinion. I kind of consider myself to be a freaky weirdo uh, of the counterculture of the 20th century. Um, I liked it back then. It was not, um, you know, they were not trying to become the establishment back then. <laughs> That's the thing. It was something that was really far out there on the fringes. So, you know, um, I don't see any of this happening here. And um, I don't think that the East, as I say, is being targeted in this way. Now, globalism wants to get its tendrils into everywhere, but this um, subversion of culture doesn't seem to be having the same effect in the East, right? So that's the thing. But whenever I um, go online and I see what's happening back in the West where I'm from, it's actually quite shocking. And so I have to share my opinions on it, don't I? Right, well, um, not enough people comment, and sometimes I don't reply. Forgive me if I don't reply, but comment anyway, right? Uh, have you watched Doctor Who? Um, or what do you think of it? And also, what do you think of the situation with UK politics at the moment? As I say, um, I'm one of these people who's neither down too many rabbit holes in conspiranoia land, nor blindly believing in any of the bollocks that comes out in the mainstream. I'm somewhere in the middle trying to discern what's going on and um, you know all I know is that I'm glad that I am uh, you know I to say living in the world of self-actualized individualism rather than in the world of collectivism at the moment because what else can you do in a time like this right in a time of identity politics and intersectionality Ultimately, the end game of intersecting us all into all these different subgroups and subgroups and subgroups, you take it to the nth degree, you end up with the individual. So let's just be the individuals that we are and find the common ground that we can do and transcend all of this bollocks. What else is there to do? Right, I shall leave it at that. I've been waffling. It's been a bit of a waffly one, this one, hasn't it? Oh, well, you know me by now. See you later, alligator. See you soon. Baboon. If you like this content, don't forget to like, subscribe and share. And while you're at it, check out all our social media links. Please help this channel grow. Your help will be appreciated.